Okay, um, hi, I'm Lori Canard and um, I'm on the steering committee. And I'd like to introduce Richard Laurent, an award-winning painter and illustrator. Richard grew up in Denver, Colorado. He received formal training in Chicago at the Institute of Design, IIT. Uh, Richard's paintings have been featured in numerous national exhibitions, including the Oil Painters of America and the Salon International Museum of Contemporary Masters. Besides painting plein air and teaching in the illustration program at Columbia College Chicago, Richard is a political cartoonist and co-producer participating artist in the National Social Justice Fine Art Initiative, the art of influence breaking criminal traditions. I had to really practice saying I could get that all out. I can never Richard, works, <laughs> Richard works out of his studio in the historic Fine Arts Building on Michigan Avenue and is currently represented by the Jackson Young Gallery. Richard's presentation today offers us insight into the palettes of some of our greatest plein air painters. So take it away, Richard Laurent. Thank you so much, Lori and Deb and Steve and uh, everybody who's uh, Mary, of course. It's a joy to be here today. Um, a quick little story before we get started. Uh, I, I was at the uh, wet paint competition in Santa Fe last, last year about June. And uh, I had a great start that day. We were at Ghost Ranch. I was at the trailhead. I watched all these painters of note go by. And uh, they were all very complimentary about the beginning of my painting. And I was very, very uh, energized. Uh, a day later, we're having the exhibition, the pop-up exhibition. And my whole piece had crashed and burned, basically. And I was thinking, it, it took me about another month to get that painting <laughs> together. And I began thinking about uh, what is necessary in terms of competition when you're, when you're out on the, on the road and you're, you're planning our painting. So today we're going to talk about uh, some of the, a little bit more about the tech, technicalities of not so much setting up the palette. We all know how to set up a palette. And we probably all have similar colors, but we're gonna look at four artists and I'm gonna share my screen in a minute when I'm allowed to here. And uh, I, I wanna give, give you this uh, insight or this brief look into these four artists. And, and uh, we'll talk about that at the, at the end of this uh, quickie session, okay? Is it okay for me to share? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. The purposeful palette, as opposed to the pensive palette, which we've all seen, right? Basic premise here, we'll start out with this. Maintaining color intensity by mixing a warm hue with warm or cool hue with cool. That's like a, a basic tenant of setting up your palette so that you get what I call clean color. Uh, the first time I saw that was a friend, friend of mine, we went out painting together. He was actually a background artist for Disney. Uh, Steve, bring up Disney again. And uh, he was painting with a double, double palette of colors. That was the first time I ever saw anyone do that sort of thing. So keep that in mind as we go through these palettes today. Now, basic, the basic palette, warm and cool, uh, it's, it's almost intuitive. The warm side, cad yellow light, cool side, lemon yellow. Blues, cobalt blue, for example. Now cobalt could, you know, it's sort of on the borderline. Ultramarine blue, cool. Cad red light, the cads are generally warm colors. Alizarin crimson, that fugitive color, uh, plant-based, which we has, has been replaced by colors like, uh, 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 I'm sorry, my mind went blank here. We'll catch up with that in a minute. And uh, raw umber and raw sienna. So those are the, that's the, a basic warm, cool palette. Okay. Now let's get right into it. George Ennis. Okay. 
famous tonalist painter. I wanted to include the dates too, Laurie, because just so we have an idea, these were all 19th century painters. George Ennis, the painter of landscapes, uh, influenced by, see if you can guess, it, uh, the famous landscape painters, uh, Poussin, Constable, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the, the tonalist group, the Hudson River School, uh, he was working, growing into this, and he changed, he, over the period of his life, he changed his style dramatically. We don't really look at his work here and say, this is George Innes. However, he was influenced directly by Corot, who was probably one of the first plein air painters uh, working seriously outside. So uh, that's sort of a background, a little bit of background for, for Innes. This is what we know. This is what we, we recognize when we see an Innes painting. I'm not sure whether this is in the Art Institute or not. You can, you can tell me if, if, you, if you remember this. Uh, and this, uh, as in, in the course of his life, Innes became very spiritual very religious, and he wanted to convey this through what we know today uh, under the title of ton tonalism, which is atmospheric, mysterious, and ethereal. So right down my alley, right? So here is a, here's a basic palette for a tonalist painting. This happens to be my palette for tonalism, and it, it uh, coincides with in us, except for the fact that he was very influenced by the, the, the masters, Rembrandt and Velasquez and so on. So he might not have had this full range of color that he worked with, uh, especially doing his field studies. But I'll go through this for a minute. I'm, I'm using basically warm pigments. I'm trying to keep most of my palette warm here. I, I'm, I, for the time being, I've eliminated a lot of the cool colors. So I'm working with a cobalt blue instead of an ultramarine blue. And I'm working with a warm white. I used to work with uh, Naples yellow. I used to substitute Naples for titanium white just because I could, right? You're, you're, you're free to experiment when you put your palette together. Transparent orange, uh, some of these are more modern colors like Portland gray, that tends to be toward the cool side. But if you're, if you're making grays and as you develop your, your palette, you start to paint, you're going to have, uh, as, as David LaFell says, patches of paint that are, your, that are your grays that are going to be, suit you very well in your painting. And yellow ochre, of course. So this is Innes's actual palette on the right. It gives us no clue as to how he painted, right? It's a little, little uh, it, bit of a conundrum. He, uh, nevertheless, I, I started this little uh, uh, field study based on that palette. So this, this is the sort of thing you get with that tonalist palette. Very subtle, sort of harkens back to classical painting. And as I said before, uh, pretty much right down my alley because that's, that's my influence. So. Let's take a look at Claude Monet, all right? Uh, Monet lived to be 86 years old, so he had a lot of time to develop. This is where he started as, as a plein air painter. Uh, kind of surprising, I, I, you know, I was, I, it, there wasn't really a lot going on here. This piece, I think the title is The Magpie. It's in the Art Institute. This is what we know and love about Monet's work, a limited palette of largely adjacent color. And what is he working with here? Well, in his later work, as we all know, or we all should know, you know, his Water Lilies series, which was painted toward the end of his life, which by the way, was, was not successful during his lifetime. Go figure. Well, here's, here's a breakdown of the color for the water lilies. It's a very limited palette of adjacent color. 
and what I would call a Naples yellow toned down with one of the other blue grays. So uh, it's broken color, that's the term, okay? So in broken color, the hues change, of course, but the value for the most part stays the same throughout the painting. That's important to remember, okay? Limited palette, adjacent colors, uh, broken color. This was his expanded palette. I picked this up, uh, this was a, translated from, from the French. And uh, so I don't understand why ultramarine blue is capitalized, but anyway, uh, lead white, which we don't use. Uh, and, and the colors are a little bit older than we are used to seeing today. Uh, there were there were CADs at that time, alizarin lake, and as I said before, alizarin and uh, viridian they're both plant based colors, so they're very fugitive. So some of these colors have been replaced by modern mo modern versions, uh, cobalt blue, cobalt violet, very soft colors. Okay, so I took a crack at a little field study. Uh, at Morton Arboretum using that palette, Monet's full palette of colors, where again, it's a uh, broken color and it's, uh, there's a, there are a lot of uh, gray violets that are happening here, even though it happened to be fall. So I was enjoying the fall colors. It was a, a perfect day to paint that day at Morton. Now we, from there, we're gonna take a look at John Singer's Sargent. And uh, Sargent and Monet, I believe met in 1887. It was probably at the Salon show or the Ray Fusay show in Paris. Uh, so they, they kind of knew each other. This is an example of one of Sargent oil, you know, on plein air paintings. And of course, Everything Sargent seemed to do had, had a magical brush stroke to it. And what most of you probably know, but some of you don't, it seems like it was an effortless process. And there was a lot of scraping and repainting going on in his paintings. Maybe not so much with the, the on plein air paintings, but he did a lot of work to get the perfect brush stroke. Uh, Remember Amy's quote from Sargent, what medium are you using? He said, my brain, that, that, was, that was terrific. Uh, now, Sargent used a palette of colors. This was his basic palette. It's an expanded palette and, uh, and he used a lot of colors that had been invented in the 1870s or manufactured in, in the 1870s. So he had a much wider range of colors available than uh, the, the, the painters of the 1840s, for example. I think the, uh, the, the paint tube was developed in, in, in the 1840s. So let's take a look at the, these for a minute. Again, this is a warm and cool palette. Mars yellow, cadmium yellow. Uh, he, he mixed these reds. I, uh, I don't, I don't use a red matter deep. And, and for all of you, it doesn't, you know, this has to do with a lot of things. It, it, uh, it has to do with intention. And I think what I'm urging you to do today is to experiment, make your color charts, uh, you know, do what Steve tells you. <laughs> uh, play with these colors and make, make your color charts. Let's look on the right side for a minute. We, he had flake white, which we're not using. Everyone's using titanium white now. Ivory black, ivory versus what, Mars black? Uh, ivory seems to be the black of choice in general. Uh, raw sienna and Mars brown, which is kind of uh, uh, an umber substitute. Uh, umber is a very complicated uh, clay-like pigment. And in the old, old days, uh, the umbers were prone to cracking. So if you're working with uh, an umber color, and I love umbers, I, lo I love raw umber, 
as almost as much as I love my wife. And the 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 key to using the umbers is she's not here, by the way. Uh, use using umbers is to mix it with a little bit of something else, a little ultramarine or a little uh, uh, red, Mars red or something, which strengthens it. It makes it more uh, flexible and it's not so prone to cracking. That's why you don't see many artists doing the final thick brush strokes using umbers. It's very simple. And then finally, he's got cerulean blue and cobalt violet. Interesting, huh? He's, he's also got his French ultramarine. So he's got a lot of blues going on here. It's a really uh, robust palette. And it's probably not the kind of palette you want to take out when you uh, uh, plan air paint. <laughs> By the time you set everything up and get all the paint out, it's time to go home. So I tried out a little fill study using his basic palette. Uh, I'm not painting in the style of Sargent or anything. It's just I'm I'm taking out these colors for a spin. Is what I'm doing because I hate painting color, you know, color sheets. So I try to try to roll that into a study of some kind. Our final artist of the day. You notice he was born in 1860. He he, he was also a contemporary of Sargent. And uh, they were working in parallel universes, basically. And this is the type of work that Darn is doing. Now, he's, he's become known in a, in a contemporary way as the limited palette, palette guy. And there are a number of demos online on YouTube you can find where, the, where various artists are doing this using a limit. This actually was a fairly limited palette, although it looks like every color he's, you know, it looks like he's working with a sergeant palette. He wasn't. This is the limited palette that I have, I've come to love a little bit in, in terms of plein air painting. You know, titanium white, ivory black, very, very simple palette, yellow ochre, and uh, Lori, I spelled that right this time, and uh, cad red light. Uh, and then the mixed colors, now this, this has a lot to do with what brand of uh, pigment you buy, whether you get that degree of uh, purpleness, for example, when you're mixing purple from, from black and cad red or whatever. Uh, so he's got mauve, we'll call it mauve, got a blue gray, kind of a cool gray actually, He's got a raw sienna and he's got a burnt orange. Now, my advice to you is if you start with the same basic colors, now in theory, you can take those four colors on the left and mix the colors on the right, if you have the right pigments. Uh, experiment, try it out. Start with the four colors on the left, I mean, uh, and, and try mixing it into eight colors and you've got a a, a plein air uh, palette that really works for you. And it doesn't take you three hours to mix, right? Now I took his very limited palette and I did a, another study. This is actually the equivalent of a plein air painting because I gave myself three hours to do it. It's a large canvas though. It's 20 by about 40, 42. And I just let it rip. I just had fun doing this. This is actually derived from a, from a shot I took in Alaska. So uh, if you look on the left, uh, I, I begin to you know, map out the, the color tones, the value shifts using those basic browns. And I'm gonna close with this. You know, we've, we've come all the way through this process of simple to complex back to simple and uh, there's a quote by Lori Put Putnam. She says, you find colors that play well together. I give her credit for that quote. And essentially you can mix all of the colors you need on a plein, plein air palette using these colors. Now, once again, you have to find the right pigments to get that kind of green and that kind of blue and so on. I, 
that's in, that's important uh, that you experiment, you play, play. I, you know, uh, Amy talked about playing, and I think it's really important to do that. Now, my final visual is uh, this is a Daniel Pinkham painting, and this incorporates, in my mind, all of the things that we've talked about here. First of all, uh, there's a tonalist aspect to it. There's also, uh, you know, uh, a broken color. You can call this impressionism if you wish. Notice something about the values in this painting. There are no blacks. There are no pure whites. It's all in the same general value range, which is a medium value range. And yet it's got all, all the stuff of a good painting. So uh, what do we learn from this? I mean, first of all, you don't need a lot of colors to make a good painting. You don't need a lot of colors to make a good plein air painting. Okay. And uh, I like Daniel's work because it's very tonalist in the sense that it's, it's very uh, spiritual. There's a spiritual element to this. He's, he's, he, and, and referencing Steve again, you know, how important design is in, in doing a painting, even a small study. So uh, I'd like to, uh, any questions anybody has, we can continue this discussion for a few minutes. Uh, if you have additional things you want to talk to me about, there's my, my email address. Uh, another quick story, uh, something Amy mentioned that resonated with me. She talked about style. And uh, I used to have, I still do, I, I, I have people, uh, uh, gallery directors who come by the studio every once in a while. And the first thing they ask me when they walk in is, do you, do you represent all these people? <laughs> and I say, uh, yeah, basically it's my, my work. So in the area, in the world of illustration, it's a, it's a man, it's like she said about art directors. They all want to know a specific style. If it's, uh, if you can replicate it, you know, <laughs> It, it's very important that they have a consistency when, when they hire you. As a painter, this is what has opened the door for me in the last few years, the ability to basically do whatever I want. So uh, it, it's a joy to do that. And uh, it's been fun to share this with you guys today too. Oh, we have, um, some, quest oh, we have some questions. We have just a little time. Of course. Okay. Uh, first one is, what was Daniel's last name? It's Pinkham, right? Pinkham. P-Y-N-K-H-A-M. Is it H-A-M? Yeah, I think so. Just like it sounds, I think. H-A-M. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. And another was, um, you mentioned brands. Do you st should you stick with one brand or do you mix and match brands? And deciding is that experimentation? I'm all over the board. I, I don't pitch any... Uh, a very close friend of mine who passed away a few years ago bequeathed me her entire collection of gambling. She was a gambling rep. Her name uh, is Andrea Harris. And, and in her memory, <laughs> I'm going to mention that today. I believe her name is on my one of my plein air painting boxes. I carry that ar around in her memory. But I've been painting primarily with gambling, but I, I'm not afraid of uh, working with Old Holland or any of the other brands, whatever works, basically. <laughs> um, I have a question from Anne. Can you recommend any books on tonalist painters and the tonalist style? Anything come to mind? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, have, we'll, have to check, we'll have to check that one out. Um, another question we had was, um, do you, how do you, do you have any ideas how you think each of these artists arrived at these palettes? I mean, it was from. Well, well, they all grew out of, of of the same basic school of working from the masters, and then developing, you know, a style to represent nature. And it, you know, at that time in the eighteen seventies, and so in in that period during that period, nature uh, was uh, symbolic of the presence of the creator, basically. 
philosophically speaking. So a lot of them were working with those themes, knowing that, let's, let's be honest, the market was looking for that. They were looking for large paintings to go in to their large Victorian homes. And uh, they were not looking for uh, field studies at that moment. So these artists would go out and do their on plein air paintings, come back and then do a, a major work and sell that from their studio. So the, the, this whole industry that is on plein air painting has grown, grown up in the last 10 or 15 years. It's remarkable. Cool. And fun. <laughs> um, a question on the umber. Um, is it due to the medium of the time or does umber still do that crack and you need to sort of, uh, you know. Well, umber. yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. The way they make umbers today, they generally, I haven't had any cracking issues except once when I, I, I did what I was talking about. I put some burn umber on a portrait I came back in on about the fourth level and it started to do some bizarre things. So I try to use, I try to thin the umber, you know, with a solvent, Gamsol or something when I'm when I'm laying in the, the underpainting. Okay. And another question is, um, are you a fan of using black or using a mixture like, you know, ultramarine blue with burnt sienna to create black? Yeah, I've always mixed my own black, quote black. And I just recently, I've started putting a little black into my paintings because, again, when I went to Santa Fe, there were plein air painters putting black in their paintings. And I would, it, it incensed me because they had a lot, <laughs> they were strong, you know, they had strong contrasts. And, and uh, I still, I always mix something into my blacks. I'll put a little ultramarine blue or uh, alizarin, uh, red in, in, in my blacks, just to, to I put up. color into my white too. I put just a drop of uh, yellow or blue or whatever, depending on what the lighting happens to be. And because I wonder if in these palettes, when they had the black, if they didn't use the black as black as much as use it as a mixing tool, you know? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the rule of thumb for classical painting, no black. No black. I'm just going to see if there's any other questions here. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, for Mary, how do the surfaces and mediums affect the palettes? Wow, that, that's, I know that's, it's a deep one. that's a lot. <laughs> that, well, that's a very personal question because when I painted in, in Santa Fe, I don't think I should even mention the, the brand of panel but it drove me crazy. It's one of the most expensive panels. And I ordered it online, had never used it before. Don't ever take anything out to the field that you haven't tested. And I just couldn't, it was soaking up my oil paint and it, and it was driving me crazy. So uh, I think I'm back to uh, Masonite with Gesso now. Just, you know, less is more. Less is more. Any other, I think, are we just about, we, we're finished at 11.15, right? We are. Okay. Yes, Richard, that right. was wonderful. I, it was great. It was so much. I, I liked hearing it the second time even more than the first Thank time. Thank you, Lori, for, <laughs> for helping me get through this without screwing something up. 